All right, folks, we are finally ready to launch. Uh, thank you for your patience with us as we sort out our te technical difficulties. We've recorded some footage uh, a couple weeks ago that we're going to kind of go through today and show you some of the things that we can see. And hopefully we'll have our live streaming abilities up soon so we can do an event like this in the future. So one of the first things you might notice is that there's a little backscatter from our camera and that's because there's a lot of particles, plankton, um, detritus kind of floating around in the ocean. Sometimes that's known as marine snow and it usually sinks down to the depths of the ocean. It can provide quite a bit of nutrients for the animals that live down here. But early in the summer or the spring when the waters are still a little bit cold, we usually have better visibility because a lot of the phytoplankton or the plant-like plankton uh, that clouds our water quite a bit in the summer hasn't really bloomed yet. So this is one of the best times to do diving, snorkeling, ROV work. Now, as we get to the substrate, you'll start to notice that there's a little bit of sand, not a whole lot of rock down here, and we're going to start seeing some life. So before I start telling you what I see, Take a moment to look around, see what kind of life you can see. One of the first things you might have noticed are the abundance of sea stars. There's two forms here. They're purple and orange, but they're actually the same species. They have two separate color morphs. These are the common sea star. And sea stars are actually probably uh, the biggest predator we're going to see down here. The ones that are quite large and kind of have a hump in the center are usually feeding and the way they feed is they wrap their entire bodies around a mussel or a snail and they'll actually extrude their stomach from their body and wrap it around their food so that they can kind of digest it outside of their body and then slurp it up like a milkshake. So even though they might not look very vicious or fast, sea stars are one of the, the biggest predators of the intertidal zone. One of the good things about our technical difficulties is that we can now kind of fast forward to the good stuff for you folks. Now, um, about 20% of the Halifax Peninsula actually used to be wetlands. And so there's a large amount of fresh water uh, coming into the harbor from runoff. And that usually results in a, a substrate bottom that's usually sandy rather than rocky. And a lot of the animals that we tend to see um, in shallow waters are usually attached to something hard. So once we get closer to the docks and pilings, we should be able to see some life. You can actually see some nudibranchs here, uh, right along the bottom. These are a pretty fun creature. They're kind of like a snail uh, without a shell and they breathe through the feathers on their back. So you can kind of see these little white bodies down on the sand. Those are all nudibranchs. Coming up to a sea star here, um, and that's our most common sea star. They come in purple and orange morphs. And they can get to be quite large. The species can be about um, a foot across, and they actually have the ability to regenerate a limb if they lose them. So you can see now we're getting into a little bit of kelp and some sand. <laughs> um, but this kelp actually grows quite quickly. We have uh, some kelp forests off the shore of Nova Scotia, but we did a launch earlier in March and the kelp in the same location was only about a couple of feet long. But now that we've returned, it's, it's grown quite a bit. They can grow over a foot in a uh, day when the sun's really going and the temperatures are right. So keep your eye out for some of the sea stars and nudibranchs because I'm seeing some more of them as we go. You'll also notice that there's quite a bit of uh, floating particles in the water. And a lot of this may be um, small bits of algae, but there is also lots of barnacle molts in the water at this time of year. Barnacles are a crustacean, so they're related to crabs and lobster. And in order for those animals to grow, they actually have to break off their shell and regrow a new one. Um, so barnacle molts, uh, they tend to molt during the same time and you'll be able to see quite a few of them 
floating in the water today. Even if you went down to the water and just looked from the surface, you'd be able to see quite a few. Now the inner tidal zone is the area of the ocean that is exposed to air during low tide. And we might be a little bit below the intertidal zone, but we see similar life from the intertidal zone until we're down about 10 or 15 feet. It depends kind of how much light an animal can get, how much wave protection it can get. We're spinning around here a bit, might get a little dizzy, but hopefully you're still with us. So we can see some of that bigger kelp now. And you'll notice that kind of to the left of our camera, there's quite a bit of light and to the right of our camera, there's quite a bit of darkness. And that's because we're swimming or driving right along the side of the dock here. And the dock actually kind of creates an entirely different ecosystem for these animals. It blocks a little bit of the sunlight, which means it's harder for algae to grow. And it gives a little bit more space for uh, some of those animals that like to live on hard surfaces. So we should definitely be able to see some sea stars eating now, look for some with their hunched backs. We've gotten a little closer to the docks now, so we're likely going to see a little bit more life in here. I already see a different species of sea star kind of in the center of our screen. Not exactly sure which type that is, but the small little orange one uh, is likely different than the, the common sea star. We do have some other species in this area, but they tend to be a little bit deeper. You can see something falling directly in your screen right now, and that's actually a barnacle molt. So you can see the fan at the top. That would actually be their legs. They live upside down with their head glued to a rock, and they actually catch their food with their legs. Strange strategy, but it seems to work well for them. So as we start to cruise along the bottom, you can see that there's actually a lot of different types of seaweed here. There's not just one. Uh, there's some browns and reds. Green seaweeds tend to live a little bit closer to the surface. One of the most common is sea lettuce, and that's the really thin, bright green things that you usually see on the beach. But down a little bit deeper, we have red seaweed and things that are red pigment actually absorb blue light. So the deeper we go, um, the more red seaweeds we'll see because they can actually harness the power of the sunlight better as a red color. You'll see there's a lot more sea stars in here, likely because there's a lot more food where there isn't seaweed. Where there isn't seaweed, there's more surface for mussels to attach to the ground. And wow, I would say there's almost 50 just in this shot right here.
Now, one thing to keep your eye out for as well are small kind of clear looking blobs um, that are actually an organism. They're called tenophores or seed jellies or comb jellies. And they move by beating tiny little hairs called cilia inside their body. And we should see some, there's one right there actually, right in the center of your screen. And you can almost see some tentacles coming off. Now these tenophores, they're not strong enough to sting humans, but they have small specialized cells in their tentacles uh, that actually, when they're triggered, uncoil and latch onto other organisms, almost like a barb. And that's one of the ways they cat, catch food. But they're passive drif drifters. They don't have the ability to swim against a current. Uh, so we actually cl classify them as plankton as well, even though they're quite small. Now, that rope you just saw was a small bait bag that we put in. And we're going to drive down here a little bit and see if we can get a look on it. We've put some kind of waste meat in our bait bag to see if we can attract any organisms because a lot of the animals that live along the bottom are kind of scavengers. So a uh, sea star would be a good example of a scavenger. Uh, crabs are a great example. And fish might feed on them, but the, the noise that we make with our V and the disturbance in the water might be enough to kind of keep them running. Now along these, the bottom, these aren't, actually aren't all just rocks. There's mussels in here. So take a second and see if you can identify any small bumps on the bottom that, are, that look alive. One thing to look for are kind of little red lips. And that's because these mussels are actually open and feeding right now. So when they're open, they s actually bring water into their body. They have small cilia to catch any particles that might be in the water and then they push the waste back out. So they're filter feeders. They can't really choose what they eat. And so when you hear people talking about microplastics in the ocean, um, this is one animal that might be affected by microplastics. If there's tiny, tiny bits of pla uh, plastic mixed in with plankton and detritus, then a mussel won't know the difference and they can actually ingest them. Now, um, small amounts of microplastics, we don't actually know what kind of harm that does to mussels yet, but mussels are one animal that we eat. And so if we are putting microplastics into the water and animals that um, feed from that water might accumulate those micro microplastics and then eventually they may end up on our plates. So microplastics are important to prevent, of course, for the animals and the life in the ocean, but also for us as we're continuing to get food from the ocean. So we can see the bottom of our bait bag here, but I don't see any critters quite yet. We'll see if we can get a bit closer. It looks like we've dropped it right in the middle of some seaweed, so it might be hard to actually see if there's any life there. There's a good chance that there's quite a few marine worms that have already found our bait bag. Um, they're, all, they're most likely going to be too small for us to be able to see with the ROV, but there are a whole bunch of species of worms that live in the ocean and they serve a similar function to the earthworms that live on land. Um, they're decomposers, so they break down a lot of things that we might, that might end up on the ocean floor. So let's keep our eyes peeled for a few more things. Another organism that we might find in the Halifax Harbor um, is a sea urchin. A sea urchin is related to a sea star because its body plan is divided into five, similar to a sea star with five arms. Sea urchins typically feed on kelp, so you might find them where there's any seaweed. So we can keep our eyes out for those. We've got a nice little nudibranch to the left there. Now, kelp provides a really important habitat for a lot of animals in the ocean. We refer to the uh, to kelp ecosystems as 
nursery ecosystems or nursery habitat. And that's because they protect a lot of protection from predators, wave action, sunlight, and they give shelter for animals as they're trying to reach their adult size. So juvenile fish might stay here. Uh, some of those other organisms that I mentioned earlier that start their life as plankton would spend some time here. And some of those organisms that start their life as plankton can even figure out which direction they need to drift in order to settle onto a surface by listening for the waves uh, on shore, the sound that they actually make. Now, these organisms don't have ears to hear, but they can feel the vibrations moving through the water in their body. And they use this to kind of give them the cue to um, change forms, change life forms, and settle down to the bottom where they can live the rest of their life. We've got some good looking mussels in here and they're kind of covered in seaweed so it's hard to tell that they're actually living but they are in fact alive and some of them are feeding so again look for those kind of red lips sticking out and that's one way to know that they're having a good meal. We're coming up here on two little tiny nudibranchs on this kind of um, piece of garbage or waste in the middle of the screen. Once we get a little bit closer, you should be able to see them. And again, those are kind of snail-like organisms, but I would highly recommend going and doing some uh, research on them because they truly do look like aliens underwater and there are so many different colors and forms of them. They're really quite incredible. You can see a few tiny minnows in the middle of our screen. Hard to tell what species those would be. Okay, so here come our, our nudibranchs, just in the center. Right there, should be able to see two of them. They're a little blurry. Now we recorded some footage a little closer to the dock so we can get a better idea of some of these organisms. You can see the lips on the mussels really well here. They're a little orange, a little red, and you can see that there's actually gaps in there between their shells. So they're filter feeding. Just on the left is a small sea pen. It looks kind of like an orangey blob, um, and that's actually a tunicate. It's a chordate, which means it's the closest relative to humans of anything that we've seen in here today, except for those minnows. And now I know it doesn't look very much like a a human but one thing that we have in common is that in our developmental stages we both have a notochord and in humans that would turn into a spinal cord but in a sea squirt or a tunicate it remains as a notochord so it's kind of just like organized nerves you can also see a sea urchin there right next to the sea star another nudibranch some sponge and maybe some bryozoan oops we got a bit too close there but you can just see how much life lives on these docks and pilings. So thanks again for bearing with us through our technical difficulties today. Hopefully you enjoyed our video. And if you have any questions, please throw them on our Facebook event. Uh, we'll be monitoring for throughout Oceans Week to answer any questions you might have. And please stay tuned as well. We'll have some more ROV footage coming to you, hopefully live soon. Happy Oceans Day, folks.